the 17th season of Bass Talk Live with your hosts, Mark Jeffries and Matt Pingrak. BTL is brought to you by Lawrence, Bass Cat Boats, AFCO, Duck and Fishing, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, Exo Lures, Yamagatsu, The Bass Tank, and Denali Rod. PTL coming at you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome once again to another edition of BTL Evening Version Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Yes, Ken Duke is back. Pinch hinting for my partner. Hopefully, he has a great. Great. Day one tomorrow on the James River. We are pulling for him and Bradley Hallman. Uh, they seem to be a little dialed in, Ken, so we'll be watching the scoreboard tomorrow and seeing uh, what develops from what I they've told me they've had a great practice. So we'll see what happens. That's always so much fun. You know, when you get to talk to the guys who are who can tell you about their practice, you know, and it's good or it's bad. And then maybe conditions change a little bit and they, they're able to stay on the fish or they find the fish or they lose the fish. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's part of what makes the sport so cool. That's part of what we're all trying to learn more about uh, fish behavior, how they're going to, where are you going to find them? How are you going to get them to bite? And uh, when you can talk to the guys who are out there competing on, on a high level, like uh, Matt and Bradley are, that's, that's very cool. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Matt will be back in studio next week. I need to remind everybody, tomorrow we're going to back up the time. Typically, we start at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. Tomorrow, day four with Frank Scalish is going to take place at 11 a.m. Central Time. So we got to back it up. Reason being, you know, this is what happens when you get old. You have doctor's appointments that you have to go to. And the doctors, they're not very flexible, Ken. They say, nope, you got to be here Thursday at this time. Well, can I come in on Friday at 3.30? No, no, you can't. Whoever they have scheduling those appointments, that is a lot of power. Well, here's, <laughs> your, your problem is, is so much more basic than this, Mark. You need to find a doctor who is also an angler and preferably a big fan of BTL. Then he's going to work around your schedule yeah i don't know anybody like that dude i gotta take what i can take man you know what they're working with here Jeez, i'm like a science project for crying out loud <laughs> <You're me both. laughs> i got You're so much both. going on in this body right here at this age hey if somebody will work on it hey i'm grateful for that so uh we'll see what goes down tomorrow but we are backing up day four tomorrow 11 a.m central time frank will be on here and one of the topics that we're going to cover is co-angler stories and i, I kind of teased it i kind of teased it last week uh i have and and me and frank have a bet on who has the worst co-angler story and i know he's the seasoned vet and i know there's a lot of people out there that have numerous co-angler stories but i think mine might be at the top of the board we'll uh, see i can't wait to hear it you know we we had mike mcclellan on uh earlier today yeah. And uh, I think it was Mike who told me a story one time about a fish surfacing in front of the boat, you know, yeah. and a co-angler making a cast past him and the line actually draped in his ear. Oh, that's oh. pretty bad. That's pretty bad. That's pretty yeah. bad. So I think uh, it was Mike who told me that story. Somebody told me that story a long time ago. I thought it was hilarious. Wow. So we will dive into co-angler stories tomorrow with Frank. All right, folks. An evening show, it's kind of a rarity with us, but I have to thank the G-Man, Gerald Swindle, for allowing us to have him on the show. This entire show was really the result of multiple fans sending me emails and messages through the website and texts. They wanted to have the G-Man on to talk about the buzzbait and talk about the buzzbait pattern and really relate anything that he can pass on to the fans to help them with their buzzbait fishing. And I, I 
said it on the show, dude. I was glued. I felt sorry for the camera guy. The camera guy sat there in that seat or stood up, whatever he was doing, and he had to zoom in and focus on that buzz bait for about 12 hours. <laughs> that was, it was, that was awesome. Tough. But what great, great stuff. And and, and Mark, the, the, a follow-up to that was yeah. uh, Gerald Swindle's appearance on, on Bass University where yeah. he gave absolutely one of the finest tutorials I've ever seen on any subject. Oh. But, 100% but I think agree. Easily, yeah, easily the best thing I've ever seen on buzz baits. Yeah. Uh, it was fantastic. And I'm, I've got a few follow up questions for the G Man. So I'm yeah. excited. I'm, I'm here to learn like, like everybody else. All right. With the Gunnersville event being next week, and we were unable because of the extension of the Elite Series to Monday, the final day, we were unable to book uh, the winner, Wes Logan. And guess what? We're going to have him on tonight. All right, we got it set up. After Gerald, we're going to have Wes on. Got his first blue trophy. We'll we'll talk to him about that. And uh, there might be a little Matt Heron discussion in that interview, too. Uh, oh. Very, very thankful for one of the baits that Wes used uh, that was actually designed by Matt Heron. So we'll get into that later. But right now, the first part of the show, it is all about the buzz bait and anything else that people want to talk about on the instant feedback or on the comments. All right. We'll try to get to Gerald, but, uh, we've got him in the queue and hopefully his mic situation is golden. Let's bring him in now. G welcome to the show, man. What's up guys. How y'all doing? Y'all hear me good. Yeah. Awesome. You got yeah. it dialed in. Everything's good to go. And first of all, man, I know the fans and myself and Ken can't thank you enough for taking time out. Uh, this was short notice. Uh, I texted you a screenshot of one of the fans that said, hey, is there any way that you could get Gerald on and talk about the buzz bait and, and dive into you know, why he was using that and why he's so good at it and how he can help me? And look at you, man. One day afterwards, you're on BTL, and uh, that says a lot for the G-Man and Gerald. And, and, dude, I greatly appreciate it, and I know the fans do also. And he went away. Uh-oh. Frozen. Dude. All right. Now, let me say this. All right. There we go. We I tested. <laughs> hey. Now you know, y'all know how the hell I feel in practice when I say I'm catching them and the next day they gone. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, I tested it. I tested it for three damn days and they gone. I don't know what happened. So, uh, there yeah. you go. It's a mystery. But I do appreciate you having me on and having the patience, Mark. I know yesterday was... I tried to take the day off yesterday and, and rest a little bit. And uh, I finished up my uh, wife's uh, gardening spot today. That's how I, I recharge is I just built a garden. You know, it's just sometimes just playing in the dirt is the, the recharge. And now I'm back. And I'm glad the fans want to know, man. It was a, it was a good week. Uh, big shout out to Wes Logan for the win. Uh, he did it on his home palm, which is the hardest thing to do sometimes. And he, he did it with – without stumbling like it wasn't something that was given to Wes he took that he went out and won it uh I, I was talking to uh Bass Radio today and they asked me about it and I was like you know I I didn't I didn't really beat myself in that tournament I just got beat and you know sometimes you think well I beat myself no I didn't I didn't have nothing for Wes on the last day so big shout out to him and his family to hold the blue trophy uh he's a good stick and I think you guys are going to be interviewing him for a long time yeah Good dude. Can't wait to hear what he has to say uh, when we wrap things up with you. All right, man, let's dive right into it. This is the first thing I'm going to do, and we're going to get into the buzz bait. I know you have the buzz bait in your hands, but I want to queue up. I want to queue up this video that shows the the type of area that you were fishing during the tournament. So let me go ahead and get this queued up. There's a good shot of you right there. Let me press play. And we'll take a look. Is that water willow? Is that what that is, G? Water willow oh, grass, got... and that's on day day four. I can't be gone. I'm right here. Okay. I got it. But, yeah, that's water willow grass. I'm swimming a jig on day four right there. Uh, and them fish would get right up in it uh, on a shad spawn in the mornings. But the way the water fell up and down in that tournament is what dictated what bait we went to and how we changed up. Day four, the water had got more colored and the water had come back up. So I went back. That was actually the first day I threw a swim, like caught a fish on a swim jig since I had been at Neely Hendry. Day wow. Four. 
but I knew the conditions were getting right. The buzz bait had got me a long way, but you know, it was one of those tournaments like on day one, I caught all my fish, but one on the main river, slow rolling a three quarter ounce uh, bass man spinner bait that I got from Carl Jacobson, put my blade on there and slow rolled it in the current. We were going out in day three of practice and he was like, mate, what are you going to do? And I'm like, dude, when the current gets high like this, I just get right on the bank, throw a big spinner bait. I said, it's kind of boring, kind of slow, but I can get bit. So I caught a pretty decent bag that last morning of practice. And I did it the first day and I caught a limit, changed up in the evening, went and caught two small keepers and then a four and a half pound on a buzz bait which set the light switch off. And I'm like, Hey, if I stay with the water stable, cause it was really weird that that lake was three and a half foot low on the lower end and two and a half foot high on the upper end. So you tried to stay in the middle where the water willow grass was just covered in water, just over the top of it and not too low. And so each day that happy medium changed. Like the first day I, I, I just fished up a little bit from the ramp. Second day, I ran new water to a whole new place. It's like I was totally running new water just to try to stay where the conditions were right in the grass. All right. Let me queue up a, another video. And, and people are going to ask, Jeffries, why are you showing a swim jig video? Well, hang on a second here. All right. Let's look at this one. That's the buzz bay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's fixing a complete <laughs> a little mat you can see how thick that little piece of grass was i was throwing but if you look around that mark you see you didn't see any other grass yeah it was, it's what we call tabletops i'm gonna call go back that, here i right, see that that's the only grass there if you stop it right there look behind that you don't see any grass it's just right there and you see me working right off the tip of that corner where that grass is the thickest yeah. And I'm trying to comb inside that grass. We call that combing it with a buzz, but you wanted to be inside the grass. Even though he hit it a little bit on the outside, every cast had to be up in it. And you wanted grass with a buzz bait that was more isolated versus giant areas of it. If it was big areas of it, you had to swim jig it. But this right here, buzz bait cast, there's two or three places it could be. And right there, he's fixing to be. Shows himself. And then the key there is, you know, I, I think is not jerking too fast and, and some of the equipment set up that we could talk about later in the show, because it was a learning experience. I really started talking with Carl Jockinson, uh, that we camp more. And I really, really enjoy this guy, his enthusiasm for learning bass fishing. He's eat up with the, the, the little things, which I, I still am too. And I, I missed that so much when I went to MLF, I didn't understand just how bad it was going to affect me. It ain't that I want to know what anybody's doing. I like to tell you what I'm doing. I could care less sometimes what everybody else is doing. It's just the thought I like to talk bass fishing. Yeah. So at night, him and I can sit around and just talk. And after day one, uh, Carl had a horrible day. He lost a four, two threes, and like a two in the first 20 minutes on a buzz bait. So as we talked about that, we looked at his equipment and how he was throwing it versus how I was throwing it. The next day he went out through the buzz bait, got one bite on it, but he had it in the back of his throat. And he said to him, and to me both, that's the key things about fishing you learn from each other. It can just be as simple as equipment setup could be the failure between a buzz bait connection and failure. All right. Now, here's the reason why I showed the swim jig video and then the buzz bait video. Why the swim jig and why the buzz bait? Is it a condition thing? Is it a structure thing? What is the difference and why did you make the decision to throw the swim jig versus throwing the buzz bait? It was thicker grass. That's all it was to it. The thinner the grass and the smaller the clumps where I could work, I could work a circle all the way around. The, like if it was a tabletop mat, I could hit every angle. So if he was there, he was going to see my bait versus uh, just being a solid line of water willow grass, which you see in that swim jig video. There's a yeah. lot of that water willow. So I'm having to throw in it and swim it through it real slow, throw in it, swim it through it real slow to try to get the fish to see the bait. Because on a shad spawn, they think, oh, the shad are in the grass and they're, they're blowing up in there. Yeah, but you may throw 20 times before he sees it because he don't sit straight up and down like a Coke bottle. He sits like this. So you, you may be all over him and him never see it. Where that buzz bait, if I could isolate the grass, the smaller the target, that's where all the big bites come from. So I would naturally switch to a buzz bait. The dirtier, thicker, the dirtier water, thicker the grass, you have to go with a swim jig because you have to make repeated casts, slow it down, and work right through the center of the target. All right, Ken. 
Gerald, I, I really admire your skills with a buzz bait. My question for you is, is given that cover, all the grass and stuff like that, and, and given the cap you're wearing, I'm a huge fan of Zoom, uh, when do you choose a conventional wire and aluminum buzz bait versus like a, a horny toad? Well, see, and that's and that's a great question because you you know for for years it was just buzz baits with a skirt on them, and then you then all of a sudden the horny toad hood, and everybody loved the horny toad because you could skip it. You know, well my mom my mama can skip it. it it's the most basic <laughs> elementary skipping bait out there. But as well as it gets bit, you have a few snag ups in it where it you, you lose more fish, you miss more fish because it's a much bigger target. So. Years ago, actually, the first year I ever really dialed this in was in 2016 when I won AOY. And I actually caught with this exact same buzz bait, same thing I make up. I caught two fish that year over seven pounds, which was a huge one was at uh, an Oklahoma mark out on Texoma where Jeff, is, uh, where Jeff Reynolds is from. One yeah. big fish there and one big fish at Wheeler on it. But I dialed in this Zoom, the, the Z Crawl Jr., because you just didn't seem to have the lap over that much plastic. It skipped well. It has lots of action, but it's a little bit smaller profile. And that seemed to kind of take over all my buzz bait scenarios where normally I was like, well, could I throw a swim bait or should I throw a skirt? I throw this. I like I I, I put 20 packs of white Z crawls in my boat and a buzz bait, and I go to fishing. And if it if it's a sunny and slick, I put a black Z crawl on with a black blade. I just like the action, the small frame of it, and the hookup ratio. And I never even throw a trailer hook with it. I try, but all you do with a trailer hook to me is I, get, I hang up, and then I get pissed <laughs> off. And then if I miss a fish, I get double pissed off, so I just take it off. <laughs> wow. All right. Hold up the buzz bait again and, and tell the fans and tell me what is really special about that buzz bait, G. Now, listen, Mark, that's like asking to see a man's pictures of his wife or something. You know, I, sometimes I love you. I, you know, there's really nothing that special about this buzz bait. And I've talked to a couple of people about building it. And, and they all want to overthink it. And I was like, hold up. I said, what makes a great buzz bait is the simplicity of it. Uh, this this bend in the wire, I can't take much for credit in the bass fishing world. You know, I, Ken knows I've got some uh, unortho no limits, AOI years at the Classic when I won it. I got some weird records, but this I can take credit for. I showed Larry Dixon that bend in that wire probably 20 years ago. We, Johnny McCall's and I were doing it to try to get more of the head down in the water to cut back on misses, like missing fish on Smith Lake. So we put a little bit of bend in the water to keep the head more under the water and the legs under the water. And it also kind of gets the hook down level instead of it being naturally on most buzz baits when they come out of the pack, they're almost like that. Where the, let me get my camera angle. The hook's kind of turned up. Oh, boy, this is backwards. This is yeah. like. This is like some Matt Pingrat casting right here. This is backwards. <laughs> but this, right, I love old Matt. So I, when you bend it back like this right here, you kind of get the hook back down in the water. Now, the blade is an inline blade. It doesn't come on. A, this is a 3 8 ounce war eagle head that I have a bunch of. This is an inline blade, which has much more metal on the wire in here touching. this. There's some things I can do with this the pot rivet. I can make it squeal like a 77 Buick coming into Walmart, or I can make it as quiet as a mouse with this tip just by my pliers and a couple of quick moves. And that's kind of how I adjust the sound of it. All right. And so I got on day four, <clears throat> it's cloudy and rainy, kind of drizzly, cloudy, hazy that last day. Not, not a lot of light penetration. The water gets dirty and I'm throwing this buzz bait and I'm like, and I actually had a quarter ounce on with a white blade. And then I had a, a three eighths ounce on with a half ounce blade. And I'm like, man, I don't think they can hear it. So here's just how quick I fixed that. You start pinching the wire down just a little bit. And now I've just built me a homemade clacker in less than 10 seconds. Yeah. So when I reel that, I got just enough clack where the fish can hear it. All right. So I go around that point and it's not dirty anymore. Guess what guys? I'm back to regular buzz bait. Just that quick. So it's just the little things like that that I've kind of manipulated the bait. I know what gauge wire you need. The, the gauge wire from the head up has a lot to do with how the bait squeaks. Most companies, and I say this openly because I don't have anybody building my buzz bait. I have to build my own. I, I take multiple baits and put them together. But most companies have way too thin a wire. So the smaller the wire, the less resistance you have inside the blade for it to squeak, to make noise. And a lot of times that's all that fish is really hearing is that, that awful squeak, 
that little bit of gurgling in the water and that if you'll watch a lot of the video you'll see me you'll see me take my wrist and twitch it a little bit when i really i really blah 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 you're kind of just trying to stir the water that's simply by having a little bit heavier diameter wire don't put a giant hook on there i've had guys say hey man i want you to try my buzz bait i'm like what are we fishing for shamu the whale because you got like 11 off bmc hook on there you know, I don't throw mine on certain equipment. There's just, there's just no, no things you don't do with equipment. So I don't need a big hook. So it's just about that simple a little super glue and a white Z crawl. It's all day long, babe. All right. Uh, one follow-up question, Ken, and then I'll send it to you. There's a lot of people on the instant feedback want to know what was your setup rod, reel, line, gear ratio. What's the best setup for that buzz bait? I give it to you. Absolutely. Hands down. It's 18 pound sun line shooter fluorocarbon and i always said fluorocarbon it sinks well my line ain't in the water i don't know where you hold your rod tip but mine ain't in the water <laughs> you hold your rod tip at 10 o'clock so the line should never enter your mind on it's going to cause the bait to sink braid is a no-no that is a no no if you see a guy throwing braid on a buzz bait dear god fish behind him because he ain't <laughs> caught but about 10 percent of them it's too fast it's not enough time to like the fish can bite it, pull you down and you can't even move and He's let it go. So I don't throw braid. I don't throw a heavy rod. I throw it a seven, three medium heavy. It's just a 13 omen rod. It's not even their highest level rod. They built some people would throw a spinner bait on it, but I'm trying to slow down my reflexes. I'm trying to slow down everything to let the fish eat it. People think, well, I want to go with braid. I don't want no stretch. Well, apparently you don't want no fish in the line. Well, neither, because that's what's <laughs> going to happen. They're going to bite it. You're going to, it's going to come over your head. And you're going to say, what's happened? So I, I stick with that same setup. And I always throw a six, eight to one reel. Never, ever throw a high speed reel on a buzz bait because you can't make yourself slow down. And you want to slow it down to the point where people's like, you know, I see a reel and it's like, man, I feel like I'm having a hard time catching up. And I'm like, ah, and that's what I want you to be. Because if you got a seven, eight to one or eight to one, and now the trend is like 10 to one and 12, I don't know, these God awful speeds, you're constantly putting pressure on the bait. Okay. Well, if he bites it, there's no room for air. Like as soon as you turn it, you pull it that far from it. So you got to think about it like that. A six, eight to one, even if you flinch, you only moved it about that, that much. One reel, you moved it this much. So you really want to fight yourself to slow down and slow down and slow down. So that's just a combination I've thrown forever. It was so funny because when I talked to Carl, he was throwing it on braid. He said, I got my own 40 pound braid. I got it on a seven something, the reel. I got it on a pretty stiff rod. And I'm like, Carl, I said, we're talking as friends. I said, I want you to try something. Put it on 18 fluorocarbon, put it on a little softer rod and try it. And the next day he said the first bite he got, it was like in the back of his throat. He said, it felt a little weird at first, but he said, I kind of see where you're coming from. It's just to slow you down. That's it. Good stuff. All right, Ken. Well, Gerald, your, your track record as a pro angler is spectacular. And uh, one of the things that I've always admired about you is, man, you are absolutely one of the very best at, at bringing five to the scales day after day after day. I know Gerald Swindle is going to bring five to the scales. And I don't think of a buzz bait as a tool that's going to get you five to the scales very often. And, of course, now I listen to your whole philosophy and system for fishing a buzz bait. What percentage of buzz bait strikes do you do you think you're you're putting in the boat because it's got to be dramatically higher than than just about anybody I can think of? I feel like in a tournament situation, if the bite is even funny and I can't catch seventy percent of them, Ken, I won't throw it. Even if they'll react to it, if I don't feel like I can catch seven out of ten, I won't throw it. Uh, I would say at Neely Henry for the amount of fish that hit the bait and pulled it down, I was probably going ninety percent. That's just, amazing. And that's that's what got me back to throwing a buzz bait because for years I was struggling with equipment and I would miss so many. And you would have those big bites that could be game changers, could be year changers, and I would miss them. So I actually just got to the point I put it in the box. I'm like, I can't, I can't deal with this. It's like dating a crazy woman. I can't deal with this. <laughs> Even though it works, I can't deal with it. That till you reevaluate your situation. It's like, hey, any bait that's that's good at triggered bites, you have to figure out a way to make it work for you. So I started reversing the mindset of super stiff rods, uh, braided line, blah, blah, blah. Where you hold your rod. You hear guys say, oh, just point your rod straight at it. Uh, no, because there's no wiggle room. You know, you hold your rod up at about 10 o'clock, sometimes 11 o'clock. 
That way there's room to move. So if he bites it for a second and you pause, you didn't pull away from him. If you point it straight at him and he bites and you do this, you spook, will you jerk the bait that far? That doesn't seem like much, but that's a big difference on a big bite. So I feel like in a tournament now, I always say, if I don't feel like I can catch seven out of 10, I just won't throw it. I feel like I've heard all the philosophies, you know, the braid, the soft rod and stuff like that. But man, yours is making so much sense to me. Um, you're known as a guy who's, wildly versatile a guy who's you know we, we talk about about you as being the ultimate junk fisherman the guy who's dialed in on fishing whatever's in front of him with whatever he needs to use to catch him and you talked uh on the bass you show about a buzz bait being a viable option anytime the water temperature is basically above the low 50s mm -hmm. what percentage of the time would you say you've got a buzz bait on the deck of your boat when the water's 50 and up I would say it never comes untied 100% of the time. And I would say over 70% of the time it's on the deck of my boat during practice wow. because I know, I know the situation when you see it. And that's what took me the hardest thing about understanding a buzz bait is how to incorporate it into a lineup. All right. So let's just say a buzz bait and Jeffrey can, I think can relate to this. A buzz bait is a left-handed pitcher that throws in the low nineties with medium control, but a lot of movement. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So he's a pitcher that you put in sometimes when you're trying to when you're trying to make something big happen, but you don't throw him all the time because he'll hit somebody and get you beat. That's how you got to look at a buzz bait. He's a left-handed, 90 throwing mile pitcher. He's got decent control, but a lot of movement. But if you think you're going to take a buzz bait and start him every game and win, you're not. You have to learn when to throw it, but you have to have it laying there. And you see a situation, you just see something happen, you think, hang on, I think a fish react to a buzz bait. Those are the days when it really makes out and makes it happen. If you think you can throw it year round all day long and survive, you can't. You have to understand when and when not to throw it, when the fish want it. It's a, it's a lot more secrets into it, like how subtle, how shallow the water is, how spooky they are. But learning when to pick it up and make it count to me was the biggest overcoming obstacle I had in buzzbait fishing is you need to always have it with you. It's like your credit card. Always have it with you. You don't know when you're going to use it. Just have it with you. All Mark, right. you know, the, the buzzbait has been a big deal. I, I remember the first time I really heard about buzzbaits was when Clun won a, a big tournament after the Classic in 76 or 77. It was a lunker lure at the time. But there are these big moments in the sport where – that rejuvenated technique or something. And Gerald Swindle, I think you were, and as it's not fair to maybe say put the buzzbait back on the map because people love buzzbait fishing. But man, I, I think you're, I think you're about to trigger something big. I hope your phone rings and somebody says, Hey, I want to build your buzzbait. It has. Most of the time when they try to build it, they try to skimp on it and I won't do it. That's the same. I'm, I'm so picky about <laughs> stuff about old age. You're like, I want to build this. I'm like, man, if you don't want to build it just like I want it, you know, but there's one thing I, I even I had to kind of re get refreshed on this week and, and it was it i stumbled like once or twice and nobody even seen it because i'm fishing a buzz bait and i would run to my next spot and i had an entourage behind me and i would be running down the lake and i would see something i would spin that phoenix around and pull in and put the trolling motor down when the next 10 boats come by me it washed the bank out and no. then i started remembering this is why buzz bait fishing is usually if you always watch it guys i catch them on day one in a tournament but not so much on day two and not so much on day three because as the crowd builds you have to think ahead on where you're going to stop your boat to keep from washing the bank out and i stumbled once or twice with the crowd i seen something i reacted and i just blew 10 minutes because it never got right so after that i'm like okay pay attention as long as you shut down and idle up to it you're fine so buzzbait fishing can be affected by the crowd as much as the weather. Wow. Good stuff there. All right, let's go to uh, a couple of questions real quick on the YouTube feedback. If you can see that, Kenny wants to know, please ask G if he hangs his buzzbait out of his truck window to get the squeak noise. No, no, I don't hold my grandchildren's head out the window to get them to be quiet. So no, <laughs> you can't. Because what happens, Kenny, was when you do that, is you burn you burn the blade up and, and this blade's only got so many casts in it and this one's about had it right here but yes you can hold it out the window and i used to do it as a kid because i didn't know it i'm like going to the lake i'm gonna hold my buzz bait out the window drive with my knees and when i'd get up there and make four casts my blade would fly off in somebody's yard and i'm like well i burn it up that the sound comes from the pop rivet it has nothing to do with the wear on the blade but the old school mentality was hold it out the window. We just didn't know that you could manipulate the 
pot rivet on there to make the sound. So no holding it out the window. Ken? Joe, you mentioned uh, the, the life of the blade. When you bend that, that War Eagle body, when you bend that wire down to get that hook riding lower, does that shorten the lifespan of the lure? Ken, I have never had it do it because if you could see it here good, I don't really bend it on a 90. I don't. There's no right. hard turns in it. I think you're really key to something there. You make a good point. If you bent this on a 90 and then back over on a 90, I think you could, you could probably weaken the wire. But as long as you just kind of keep a soft, subtle, almost like a soft S in there, you're just trying to get the head under the surface, and that's it. Well, I, I appreciate your showing it so close there because right after your Bass U seminar, I went out to the garage, and I think I probably destroyed a buzz bait. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I've got in a hurry, and I'm supposed to know what I'm doing and bend it the wrong way, and I'm like, hey, Goober, you went the wrong way. <laughs> My buzz bait's all up in there. So, yeah, you can do that. Jeez. Hey, why the red head? A lot of people want to know about uh, that. I just think it's a little bit offset. You know, people got the red hook. I just, War Eagle used to make them like that, and I started throwing it, and for whatever reason, they seem to bite it. Uh, I'm bad about throwing a chartreuse head, too. Just uh, red and chartreuse seems to be my favorite. Even if I'm throwing a black blade and a black trailer, I still like to throw a chartreuse head. Okay. Oh, very cool. All right. Joe, I noticed that you seem to be setting the hook. You're, you know, you're not delaying. You're not counting. You're not doing anything when you see the bite you're setting the hook is that because you've just got the system so dialed in with the fluorocarbon line and the rod strength and stuff like that i think it's probably a little bit of muscle memory and reaction but uh one thing i try to do ken is never take my eyes off the bait never ever ever take my eyes off my bait and i usually will never ever jerk until the bait is gone so whether it's gone instantly or in a few minutes because i had on day two i had some really big ones roll under it during the day if he's watching live, I didn't. I, I got wouldn't even flinch. I'm like, that's a big one, but he didn't get it. So basically, I use my eyes and then muscle memory. Once the blade is gone on the water, I jerk. You know, I think it's just something you kind of dial in your rod position, and then, and, you know, I, people say, why not 20 or 25, 18 pound uh, shooter sunline, dude? You can throw it a long way. So what you're trying to do is do faster casts. You might want to cast a long way. You might want to do a short cast. It's so much easier to handle on a reel. And you're not going to break it. I mean, I boat flip all of them, even the ones that don't come in the boat. I'm boat <laughs> flipping them. And you're not going to break your line. So you're at 18 coast to coast, border to border, pretty much, even in Florida, in the grass, heavy, heavy grass? Yes, sir. Like, I, I throw 18 everywhere I go. I never change it. Never. Uh, I don't care you, if I'm in you, Lake Fork or whatever. It's because I'm used to it. I know the strength of it, and no matter what the cover is. And what I've learned is if I go too heavy a line and they get down in the cover, well, naturally I start wanting to pull on them. And usually I end up pulling them off where if I know I got 18 and they wrap me up in a piece of wood, I'll take pressure off of them and go get them. Where if I had 20 or 25, I'm start, I'd probably just start pulling on them. I love everything you're telling me because, you know, you've, you've, you've engineered everything about that system to make it work so beautifully. And, and you've taken all the, all the subsequent tinkering out because you're so dialed in with it and you know exactly what it'll do. I think that in itself is a great lesson to the rest of us. I've that, lost more money on a buzz bait than probably anything else out there in the business, <laughs> but it was also the bait that allowed me to win enough money uh, around home to build my career on with Johnny McCombs. When I tell people that I've thrown a buzz bait from here to China, they laugh. They, oh, he's just saying that. I'm like, no, I throw it from here to China and back. I said, Johnny and I fished for years and we fished night tournaments from seven to seven at night, seven at night, seven in the morning. And I could, could not tell you how many times we blasted off with two rods on the deck. One was his and one was mine with a buzz bait. So I've had many, many hours throwing them. I've had many failures with them. And I've worked so hard to try to figure out how to cut that down to even the man himself. Johnny McCombs called me last year. You fall and he goes, hey, dude, he said, what are you doing on your buzz bait? Because he said, I'm struggling. And I said, well, first off, you're dropping slack in your line, you're setting the hook. I said, reel through it, throw 18, because he was throwing bigger line. He says, is that it? I'm like, I'm telling you, dude, slow your reaction now, watch the blade, and don't set the hook. You just kind of pull into it. Wow. wow. I love your story about Johnny McCombs. It was great to see him return to the tournament trail a couple of years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. And he's, he's a buzz baiter. He's an old school buzz baiter from way back. I've, I can remember night after night of fishing Smith Lake just all night, and all you would ever hear was that zoop, zoop. <laughs> all night long you know and I, my camera guy i told him i said you're gonna hear that in your sleep and the next morning he said dude when i laid down all i could hear was 
zoop, squeak, 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 <laughs> zoop, squeak, squeak, squeak. But it was fun to see a camera guy like that. And I and I, I told the guys at Bass that, and even Wes and them at JM, I said, that's as a young camera guy, it's probably one of the best I've ever been in a boat with as far as being in the game and being fired up for me and watching and getting the shots because when I boat flip a big one and look at him, he's breathing like he run one up the middle. He's just, <laughs> he's got that million yard stare. And I'm like, man, that's what it's all about. And he said that then he said, dude, I fish, I fish a lot. He said, so every time you throw that bait, he said, I'm glued to it like a cat with a laser. He said, I'm just staring at it through this viewfinder, which that's what makes really good footage because yeah. seeing the bite on a buzz bait is what we all as anglers live for. Ken and, and oh. Jeffries, you guys have talked about it, wrote about it for years. Yeah. That's the things that makes guys get up with four and five hours sleep, drink three cups of black rifle <laughs> coffee, drive an hour to the lake just for one buzz bait bite. That's yes, what it's sir. all about. Yes, yeah. sir. Absolutely. Great stuff. Yeah. All right. Uh, questions. First, let's go to the Bass Zone instant feedback. Cameron wants to know, does G ever throw a three blade versus a two blade? No, sir. I don't, Cameron. I throw the two blade always because the three blade doesn't skip as well to me and has a totally different sound. And I, it's just not something I have a lot of confidence in. Not saying it doesn't work. I just don't throw it a lot. All right, let's go to YouTube. Drew wants to know, can you ask uh, ask G when to throw a buzz bait versus a frog or a spook? He, he said he saw all three being thrown during this tournament. You, strictly, the buzz bait is dictated by the cover. You know, you, want to, you know, you can't throw a spook in that water willow grass through it. You can throw it around it. You can throw a frog kind of through it some, but it's so much slower. When the water was dirty, you couldn't move fast enough. So a buzz bait then is your number one option. The water's a little color. You need to move a little faster down the bank, but you need to be able to comb through the cover, but yet present a sound that they will bite, but not over the top. So to me, cover dictates which one of those three you throw and water clarity. All right, let's see here. Back to the YouTube uh, instant feedback. Let's see here. Chris G wants to know, gee, do you ever throw an inline buzz bait? Yes, sir. I, I do, Chris. I, I, I don't say this often. I'm going to go ahead and take, I'm just going to say it. Hell, I don't care. I built that Bobby's perfect buzzing frog. That Bob, I don't even know who Bobby is, but I didn't get the credit for it. I finished second at a, uh, uh, one of those big snag proof tournaments up here. And I built, a, I took my buzz back. We lost him. He's coming back. Uh, he's coming back. That's his internet. <laughs> uh -oh. I cut, I, I moved the blade from here to here. All right. I put it right there. And then I cut this back wire and made a loop in it and put a snag proof junior frog on here. And I lit their butt up on Gunnersville. We didn't win. We finished like second. Well, somebody had protested us because they see me fishing on the main river in the wind. And they said, there's no way he was throwing a frog. Well, I was. But at that time, you could add anything to it. So I built an inline buzz bait on the back of a frog. So they said, for liability, we need to take your bait with us if you don't mind. So I give it to them. Well, next year at ICAST, I walked through there, and there's Bobby's perfect buzzing frog. Wow. And my wife went, who's Bobby? And that's G's. <laughs> wow. So, yes, I do throw an inline sometime. With a situation like that, I will build an inline buzz bait to put on a frog, a hollow belly frog, because it floats so good over heavy cover, but an inline buzz bait is still good. So there's my, I, I can't say much, but I know I built that. They took my bait. They called me about it. And then the next year they released it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a scoop there. All right. Let's see here. Uh, several people want to know what was the water temp when you were catching them on the buzz bait? 68, 68 to 70. It would range a little bit in the morning. Uh, it might get a little warmer, 71 on a sunny day, but then back down to 68. All right. Uh, what about drilling holes in the blade? People do that for bubbles. They think, well, I'm going to create more bubbles. I don't like to do that because it takes a little weight off the bait and it doesn't have the same sound. I'm looking more for the, the gurgle of the bait the bloop, 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 versus the when you drill them out, they don't have that same gurgle sound. And they say, I hear people say, man, if it's creating bubbles, they're biting it. Hey, if I base my day on bubbles, I'm not going to do good. I throw it. <laughs> I don't worry about if it leaves above a trail or not. So a lot of that came. Delay. <laughs> if it leaves a bubble trail, they're biting it. Yeah. And I'm like, not a bubble trail. All right. Uh, let's see here. Next one. 
Elbert want to know, he wants to know, will the Buzz Bay play at Gunnersville? Now, Elbert, you shouldn't ask that because you're going to put me on the spot. I liked you until then. <laughs> yes. Yes, Elbert is probably going to play at Gunnersville. There you go. All right. Great stuff. We've I, had an unseasonably warm, uh, a cool spring. Uh, we have not had – when I woke up this morning, it was 51 with a north wind, and it stayed chilly all day to late the season. So we're still having cool nights. And as long as we do that, you're going to see top water play, whether it's a big walking bait or a buzz bait. But I think, Elbert, stay tuned for uh, watching Bassmaster Live because you're going to see some top water action. All right. Next question. Robert wants to know, what's your favorite buzz bait colors depending on visibility? Oh, Robert, I'm going to disappoint you. I throw a white one and a black one. I throw a white 90% of the time, and when the sun comes out and gets bright, I throw a black one. I do not mess around with other colors. All right, let me ask you this. How important is water clarity? Clear water, stained water, muddy water when it comes to throwing a buzz bait? When it comes to buzz bait, the only thing that water clarity dictates is the sound that it makes. It, it, uh, clear water, it, it's so weird about buzz bait fishing. It doesn't matter. Like on Smith, I was raised there. You could see 15 foot deep, and I can remember just watching largemouth after largemouth come out of a tree and run 20 foot to bite it. It's the gurgling on the surface. It's something they can't stand. The only thing that would dictate, like change up how I do a buzz bait in the water color is whether or not I, how much noise I wanted to make. Would I want it to clack or rattle? The, the muddier the water, sometimes you'll notice you need a little bit more sound and a little bit slower retrieve. Water clarity like at Smith, I'm going to reel it a touch bit faster than what you think I probably should be reeling it just so they don't look at it too much. You know, you're trying to get it away from them. So the dirtier the water, slow it down, clear the water, speed it up. But other than that, nothing matters. Ken, anything to follow up from those questions? Oh, man, I, I don't want to keep Gerald too long, but I could talk to him all night about this. Uh, you made a great <laughs> You made a great comment the other night on, on uh, the show with Bass U about uh, your follow-up bait. When if, if you happen to miss a fish, which in your case, because you're so dialed in, doesn't happen very often. But you talked about, I think you talked about a, fl a fluke that matched the yep. bait. Color. Here's my question, though. This is a little different, um, which I think that's a that's a great tip to try to match up the colors so they'll think it's maybe the same yep. thing. Oh, what about on days when they're not quite committing to the bu to the buzz bait? They're they're bullets in the water, but they're not hitting it. What is your what is your backup approach to those fish? I think when you see that, like on a tournament day, when you pull out there in the morning and the first three or four you have come up on them. Uh-oh. He'll be back. They don't really <laughs> kill it. They're just bowling under it. They don't bite it. And you're like, what's going on? They're just not getting it. That's your sign to start right then making adjustments, whether it's a 5 16th swim jig trying to be the surface or whether it's a spinner bait trying to be the surface. But you, they have just told you if you go – three strikes in a row with a buzz bait and none of them's got it, put it down. And then, like you said, start making adjustments. It could be anything from small spinner baits to swim jigs. You have to start exploring right then. And most of the time that'll dictate to what your cover will let you fish. If it's water willow grass, there's not a whole lot you can get through there besides a swim jig, possibly a little spinner bait. So you don't have the options of being able to throw a spook or a popper or anything like that or uh, a wake bait. But it, three strikes and you're out in my book. If I if I take off in a tournament morning and I have three big ones come up and they don't even pull the bait down, I'm done with it. What a great rule of thumb, the three strike rule. I love that. That's awesome. Do That's I get really to tell good. my co angler story? You, if you got one, <laughs> heck yeah. I'm just gonna give a rule of thumb. I'm not even gonna tell my story. I almost did. I almost did a blog on this. I didn't, and I've been sitting on it because I I tell somebody. I said you can always know. Here's OG's judgment when he is a co-anger. Pros and co-angers. So if you're a co-anger, listen up. If you're fishing <laughs> with a pro and it's right off the bat and his boat is blowing into a pier or a boat dock or a concrete wall or a shark-eating manatee and you don't even put your foot out to stop it, you finna have a long day. Because what <laughs> you just told me is you don't care nothing about my boat or the equipment that's getting you there. It's all about you. And I know we say that in a joking way, but I can't tell you how many mornings I've started out and be drifting around something and my boat blow into something and it's just fixing to crush a bridge pillar or a dock piling and a co-angler not even move. Wow. Okay. All right. And then I can't tell you how I reacted right opposite when my boat got remotely close to something and the co-angler put his rod down and grabbed it with both hands. See, that's the guy that OG is going to take care of. No matter what happens that day, if I get my five, I think, hey, dude, you respect me and my equipment. 
I'm going to respect you and more than just, hey, let's have a great day. I'm going to go out of my way to make sure you catch some fish because you show simple respect to the equipment. So if you get a co-anger that says it's all about him and he don't care what your boat hits, it sends off a really bad signal. You know, I had a kid in Florida a couple of years ago. I got a brand new Phoenix. He's eating a foot long sandwich in the tournament. He lays it out in the carpet, Jeffries. It's the first tournament in my boat, in my Phoenix. And I'm proud of this thing. Like I just want to, I want to lay down and hug the steering wheel. And I look back there and there's pickles and lettuce and cheese and he leaves it laying out. I got worm dye. I got bottles rolling under my feet. And I'm looking at him like, hey, bro, get that, get that, pick that up if you don't mind. Pick that up if you don't mind. He would not pick it up. He just left it in the floor. And I'm like, really? You wow. gonna take a brand new boat and eat a sandwich and have lettuce from end to end of this boat as you keep fishing? So either your mama didn't slap you with a flip-flop or you don't care nothing about my boat. It's called respect. And I think... The angler, the pro has just as much responsibility to be respectful to the co-angler as in uh, making sure he has a little room to cast. And if he if he's fishing a technique where he can't, also offer him a backup technique. I will never draw a co-angler and say, hey, I got to I gotta get right up against the bank and parallel so you just screwed all day. If I have to say, man, I'm going to put the boat against the bank and I know it's not fair for you, but what I've done is I've been pitching around a drop shot some with a short leader and about six, eight foot of water, been able to catch a few fish. So if you want to rig that up, I'll have the worms. You just get in the boat. I, I'm not going to just throw you out to the whoops, but you let my boat blow in a concrete bridge and you don't even reach for it. I'm going to tell you, all the water you're going to get has been drunk and slobbered over. So this is going to look like hot bush light because I'm about to roll down it. And that's just a rule of thumb that people never think about. I, I see co-anglers that say, well, I've never really thought about it like that. I can tell you, I drew a gentleman, uh, Mr. Leon, last year at Sam Raven, and right off the get-go, my boat went to hit something. He stopped what he was doing and reached out and caught my boat. And I turned and looked at him. I said, man, you're going to get along real good because you just showed me respect that you didn't have to. And that's just how we look at it. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what stands out. So I don't have like one particular story, but I'm saying – the reaction that anger has in the back. And the number one thing you never, ever, ever, ever tell your anger, your pro anger, is if I don't get a check, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> you know how many times I've heard that? Oh, my god! I said, you want me to give you Lulu's number and let you call her? Because she ain't going to be proud of either one of us if I don't catch some. So I wow. said, you know, I hear that over and over. If I, if I, if I don't get a check, man, my wife's going to be upset because we I, – I, I get it, man, but – that's not on me today. That's on you, you know? So just think about things sometimes before you sail. So the dude was having a picnic just back there on the dude, back deck. <laughs> he had more food. He had, I'm not kidding. He had die in the floor of my boat. The guy ended up finishing in the top five of the tournament, totally trashed my boat. And then got all the way up there and asked me, said, man, what do you think I need to give you for gas? So let me get this straight. You just finished fourth. <laughs> You threw over me all day. You threw past me all day. You spilt dye on my carpet. You done everything you could to get in the way, but yet you worried about giving me twenty dollars for gas. He gets twenty dollars. I said, I tell you what, you 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 keep that, bro. You keep it. I spent more than ice that week in that right there. So you just keep that. Twenty dollars wow. is not acceptable. And they'll say, well, we didn't go very far from the ramp. Yeah, but I burnt four hundred dollars worth to figure out to fish at the daggum ramp. That's what you're paying for. You paying. It's part of the expense of the three-day practice the guy worked so hard for to get you on fish. Yeah. It ain't about what we did that day. $20 don't buy a pack of Paul Malls and some Laffy Taffy. You can't do nothing with that. <laughs> you know? So I and I and, and here and my wife will tell you she's seen it every time. 99% of the time when my co-hanger say, Hey, gee, what owe you for gas? You owe me nothing, dog. Why? Because you ask. Yeah. If you ask me, dude, I, I, I'll take it on. It's on me, bro. Let's have a good time. But if you dish me at the end of the day and don't even say, hey, what I owe you for gas, and you run off, mental note to self. That's no way to treat your boat. Whether you had a good experience or a bad experience, it still costs to be there at some level. Yeah. You know, so that's I, – I, I run in that a lot. I tell my nephew all the time, Trey, as he's trying to fish as a – in the front of the boat, he's young, and sometimes things happen. He's like, gee, they're throwing past me. I don't know what to do. I said, hey, son, 
it's it's in your delivery how you handle it just be respectful i always tell you, just be respectful but if they don't respect you and your in your property then you really don't owe them any explanation after that on how you fish i, I don't explain how i'm fishing if you respect me every time i pull in i'll say hey mark there's a little old rise out here. It jumps up to eight foot. There's some shell on end up. We're going to be throwing a crankbait across it and go that way. But the first time you let my boat hit the concrete or you spit in the floor, I ain't saying nothing. Wow. I mean, people might think I'm bad, but I'm like, no, no. That it, yeah. it's, you treat each other like true professionals. Yeah. Ken, he said the word, respect. That's been a That's big word, word today. Yeah. Uh, we, Ken and I got into a big discussion about that word, uh, prior to the show and it's a word that comes up a lot that a lot of people forget about no matter what situation you're in that small little world is a big factor in so many things that we do in this game and sometimes it gets lost it's that way in life jeffers it shouldn't yeah. just be that way about fishing no you're I'm right same, man. i'm the same way about a guy that don't put his shopping cart up at walmart and pushes it out against my tundra uh, i'm yeah. like so really you just gonna let it hit me uh I'm the same. I mean, I could sit and do a whole show with you and Ken on the word loyalty. Yeah. Because people throw that word around like, oh, companies about you got to be loyal. I've been loyal. <laughs> okay. I've been loyal for 20 years, but yet when you left, you didn't even say thank you. So, where, where, where is loyalty in the fishing world? It used to be when Ken and I met and Mark and you and I met, it, loyalty was having your friends and people you work for, you respect the people, you were loyal to them. Now, loyalty is a word that sometimes big corporate companies use to get you to stay and be underpaid. Yeah. And that's unfortunate that it, it worked out that way because my mom and daddy raised me to be loyal to a fault. You ride the train till it wrecks. And as I progressed in my career, I worked for one company for 18 years that just let me go and said they were just a small company and then hired 42 new people. Yeah. after 18 years and didn't give me any explanation. I worked for another guy 20 years. And when he left, he didn't even say thank you. Yeah. You know, so I start thinking, why, why is loyalty pitched to, it could have been done to Ken. If he worked for a big organization and say, well, Ken, you need to be loyal to us and stay, even though we can't give you a raise. Okay. But loyalty don't go in the bank drive through box. It's hard to get that word in there. They don't, it, so I, I'm like, I've been the guy that's truly been torn over the last two years of my career about my daddy tells me to be loyal. My mama taught me to be loyal. But where does it stop in the corporate world? Or is loyalty a word that we use to hold someone ransom? Yeah, that's a great point, man. Great point. All right, Ken, I've got a couple of final questions. Do you have anything to wrap up with, uh, well, with G? Just to wrap up with Gerald, man, this is fantastic. The The information you give out is always so great, Gerald. It's always, well, A, it's always really insightful, always very entertaining. You're just the best at communicating that message. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for doing what, what I wish everybody did more of and did as well as you do, which is to make our sport fun and wildly successful as you are, you know, you're because you're, you just know how to catch them. I really um, appreciate that. Thank you for all that. I really appreciate it, man. All right, G, a couple questions, and then we'll let you go. One, uh, it seems that this year is the year of the topwater. Uh, you know, Matt and I got into a big discussion prior to him leaving uh, for the Open that it seems like a topwater has been a key lure in just about all of the events for the first time in a long time. Ken, you could chime in on there. It's been a while since we've seen so much action on top of the water this time of the year. Maybe it's the, the lakes. Maybe it's the schedule. I mean, what are your thoughts, G? Uh, it, it's pretty simple to me. We just talked about Bango. This is the longest spring I could ever remember fishing. We've had uh, lots of rain, lots of cool nights. We had nights in the uh, end of April in the 30s here in Alabama. And when it happens like that, we still linger. And we're in May and the water temperatures in the 70s it's going to be a top water kind of year. And the problem is it got warmer quicker. So there was guys catching them on top water in the end of February, 1st of March. And it hasn't let up because it never got hot enough to stop it. So it's all about weather. Yeah, it's been great. And I got to give it up to your camera guy that you had, had that lens on the buzz bait. <laughs> I, it, what, 12, 14, 18 hours? <laughs> Who knows? 
He was whooped, man. At the end of the day, he said, gee, I know you're tired. Because he said, dude, I'm exhausted just watching. <laughs> I said, man, I appreciate it. But I, I really thank you guys for having me on. And, and Ken, you're, you're always complimentary. And, and no one knows more about the sport, the stats, and what people do in it than you do. So you're, you always kind of have a really good insight for me to look back on it. This guy knows, you know, he, he knows what every angle strength is, weakness is, and Mark, anytime we can get together, let's do it again. I know it's been pretty hectic this week, but uh, yeah. we'll get through Gunners when we'll settle down. If you want me back on, just let me know, and we'll try to get a better headset. But right now, it's still working. Yeah, <laughs> consider it done, man. We'll get you, you back it. on. We'll get you back on uh, before you guys take off for the Northern Swing. And uh, it was fantastic watching you last week on Bassmaster Live. Enormously entertaining for all those people that are obsessed with top water and buzz baits. And folks, if you don't watch it, you need to go watch what was on uh, Bash University, the session that he did on the buzz bait. It was epic. It's one of the best things you've done, Gerald. I really appreciate it, guys. And thank you for being so patient with me because I know during Bassmaster Live, I think I said some things that people <laughs> wonder. And then I'm, I don't know. I just say whatever comes to my mind. Well, yeah, I, the, this comment kept coming up about the yellow thong. Yeah, they were asking me what I'd done different. I, mean, you know, I was like, I just made a few adjustments and, and I bought a yellow thong. <laughs> and they are like, what? <laughs> and then I told them that the water was going up and down faster than the hooker's britches. And they were like, what? And I'm like, well, I just... I mean, if I think about what goes up and down pretty fast, it'd be a hooker's britches. So that's kind of what I say this water to. It. So sometimes I say things and I'm like, I, sh I probably shouldn't have said it. Or I don't even realize I said it. But it's fun that the fans pick up on that and we all laugh together. Nobody takes it too serious. Because at the end of the day, it is fishing. It's one of the funnest things we can do. There's so much learning to be done. And it's supposed to be done smiling. It's not supposed to be done crying, even though there's ups and downs in it. So everyone out there, let's just enjoy it. Uh, fishing, try to have a good time, and if they bite, they bite. If they don't, we'll just go home and cut the grass. That's all we can do. All right. Great stuff, man. Best of luck at, at Gunnersville, and we will talk to you soon, man. See you guys. Thank all you, right. Gerald. There you have it. Gerald Swindle and fantastic juice there, Ken. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, Gerald's such a great guest, you know. Yeah. A lot of guys are informative. A lot of guys have uh, tremendous know-how. But he, when you combine that and, and are, you're so entertaining and engaging, that's a tough combination to beat, you know. Uh, but, man, I, I just – I had no idea the depth of his his buzzbait philosophy. Yeah. 18-pound fluorocarbon. Yeah. Take note of that. I wonder how many oh. people out there that are doing that with a buzzbait. Well, after I saw the Bass U thing, I spilled up with 20 because I didn't have any 18, and now I've got to strip that off. <laughs> The sunline's going to be flying off the shelf out there. People buy an 18-pound fluorocarbon for buzz baits. Because, you know, Gerald's talking about how you can throw that 18 a long way, and, and I know the difference between how far I can throw 18 and how far yeah. I can throw 20 is probably measured in inches, but I may still strip the 20 off. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, Good stuff. I learned so much. Great stuff. All right, man. Ken, you have to go, right? You got to cut I out. Go. I apologize. I've got a, yeah. a trip to Iowa tomorrow. So uh, my congrats to Mr. Logan and, uh, and 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 this the first big step toward a twenty four seven BTL channel. Yeah, we're working on that. <laughs> Wait till Matt <laughs> hears about that. What do you think he's going to think about that one? Uh, he might not be real excited at first, but then he's going to realize all the merch possibilities, and he's going to be yeah. into it. Yeah. Do you think? Uh, do you think he can go twenty four hours? He's still young. Yeah. It's a He's lot of energy young. drinks, man. A lot of energy drinks. All right, folks. Hey. We're going to take a break. Come back with a man that has the blue trophy from Lake uh, Neely Henry and just a fantastic win uh, for Wes Logan. And uh, can't wait to hear what he has to say. Folks, got to thank Ken Duke for pitch hitting for Matt. Matt will be back in studio next week. But, Ken, fantastic job. And I know... I know that people out there appreciate your knowledge and uh, the history that you have of this game. So uh, have fun in Iowa. We will have you back on soon. And uh, take care, man. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks for having me. It's a blast. All right. Great stuff. All right, folks, we're going to take a break. Come back with Wes Logan. Everybody stay tuned on the evening version of BTL. Ultimate fishing system starts with Lorenz HDS Live. 
the best fish finding tools from trip sonar and fish reveal to active imaging and new active target live sonar and complete touchscreen control from your trolling motor to your big motor for a limited time building the ultimate fishing system will be easier on your wallet Upgrade to HDS Live with a Ghost Trolling Motor, Active Target Sonar, or Live Sight Sonar, and save up to $800. FastCat's legendary 20-foot platform has been paired with Angler-approved accessories for 2021. Puma FTD features the proven hull used by many of the top names in bass fishing today, backed by a transferable lifetime warranty. The Puma FTD boasts a full team deck concept which enhances efficiency for you and your tournament partners. Turnkey tournament winning performance. The Puma FTD SP from BassCat. Let's face it, fishing electronics are no longer an afterthought. They've become a necessity. And at the Bass Tank, our experts match you with the right electronics provide professional installation, and educate you to help maximize your catching results while providing support along the way. <laughs> because let's be honest, it's about catching, not just fishing. And when you're ready for better results, join the Bass Tank team. Visit us today on Facebook or go to thebasstank.com. You've been waiting all week for this. And Sunline wants to make sure you're ready for it with bulk spools of all your favorite fishing lines. That's so fun. Bulk up with Sunline. Utilizing my experience utilizing my time on the water, evolving as an angler. And that evolution should never stop. You have to do it every day. From when you wake up in the morning, you gotta be thinking about changing, continually changing every minute, every task. That's really the premise of fishing the moment. Everyone, Brandon Polnick here. People always be asking me what I got tied on. And I'm like, X-Zone lures. And they're like, Brandon, why you got X-Zone lures tied on? And I'm like, let me show you why. The bite. Hey! Get out of there. Get out of there. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's freaking oh, Get in here. Oh, God. Giant. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think you get the point. All right, we are back, the PM version of BTL. And in case you missed the interview with Gerald, uh, the replay will be up immediately after the show. Give me about 30 minutes. And uh, great stuff. Some really, really good juice on the buzz bait. Uh, I want to remind everybody, tomorrow, day four with Frank Scalish, we have backed up the time to 11 a.m. Central Time. Uh, and we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Uh, a topic of discussion is going to be co-angler stories. So uh, Frank will dive into some of the memorable stuff that he has experienced over his elaborate career. And uh, I got one story. We'll we'll see if he can top it. It's pretty good. Only a few people have been told this story that took place back in the Red Man days, and it involves two people, not just one person. But two, that's all I'm going to say about it. You got to tune in tomorrow to check out uh, what Frank and I are going to talk about. All right, folks, it is time for our next guest. And the man got it done, got his first blue trophy. And I really, really appreciate him taking time out this evening to come on to the show. If you have some questions, just like with G, throw them out there on the instant feedback or on the YouTube comments. And we will get those questions to Wes. So let's bring him in now. Wes, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, buddy. I appreciate you having me on. Hey, I know it's late night. I appreciate you coming on in the evening, and that is an absolute perfect backdrop right there with the blue trophy in the background. For sure, for sure. I'm glad it's back there, I promise. All right. Now, uh, 
I, I, I always ask this to somebody that, that wins for the first time, and, and it's, it's something that I've done over the years. Sometimes we get great comments. Other time, they're like, uh, nothing happened. Have you been to the bank yet? Have you deposited the check? And what was the response when you handed that check to the teller? I, uh, I actually deposited the check this morning, and the, actually the, where I took it to the bank is one of uh, he's a really good friend of mine. He's actually a friend, a friend of our family. So he kind of knows the whole fishing deal. And uh, he knew I had won and, and, you know, he'd done congratulate me and stuff like that. And I told him I was coming up there. But when I got in there and sat down at his desk and handed it to him, I said, I'm glad that thing's out of my hand because it makes me nervous. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's got I, too I, many zeros. I was about to say there's a lot of zeros on that thing, and I'm not used to that. <laughs> Wow. All right. I want to go back to the beginning. Uh, when, when you saw the schedule and saw how things were going to set up, what were your thoughts? Uh, as far as, you know, seeing the Neely Henry tournament, I, I, obviously I was excited that it was going to be here near the house and it was going to be, you know, on my home lake. But I didn't think it was going to set up as good as it ended up setting up. I thought it was going to be a little bit early. And because I, I, I've done really well on this lake you know, and a bunch of BFL. I've won some BFLs here, some, you know, federation championships, but they've all been in June to September. It's, it just seems to be once they, the spawning situation is all done, it's when I can really dial stuff in and figure it out. And lucky enough, I was able to, you know, obviously put a few things together earlier than I normally do. And I mean, it, obviously it worked out. Yeah. Mentally through your practice, with all the knowledge and experience that you have on this body of water, what were you thinking about with the rising water, the falling water, the cancellation? What were you going through, man? Yeah, I mean, obviously the first day of practice, we had good conditions. Uh, I practiced down the lake because I, I just know the caliber of fish that live down the lake. And I had an okay practice uh, on that first day. Thought I kind of figured a little bit of something out. Didn't know kind of what weight I could catch, but Obviously, looking at the forecast, I knew something was about to change, and, and you never know if the weatherman's going to be right or not. And actually, he was he was wrong in a way that we got more rain than we actually expected. So, I, I mean, day two of practice was a wash. Didn't even hardly get to go out there. You'd fish for 30 minutes and have to go under a dock to get out, not get struck by freaking lightning. But <laughs> I was sitting in my camper watching the water rise up, on, up up the river near the launch as the day went on like hour by hour it was just getting higher and higher and higher and i mean just with all that going through your mind you're like and i've seen it a couple of times where it's gotten like that and you know it's really hard to get a bite truthfully because everything gets so crazy so fast the fish are kind of in shock and don't know what to do they don't want to rush up in that flooded stuff because they don't know how far it's going to fall back down and with it doing it in the springtime, you've got bass on the bed up there where it's, you know, the water's rising. So now you've got a fish that was in eight inches of water spawning. Well, now he's got three foot of water on his head. And I mean, it, it's hard to catch a bass spawning that's three foot deep that you definitely can't see. And you didn't know he was there to begin with. And yeah. then on the opposite side of that, below Minnesota, what we call Minnesota bends is it's four foot low down there where you had a bass, you know, spawn again, spawning in eight inches of water. Now it's three foot dry from where he was at. And you know, he's not in a mood to want to bite. So he's he's just thinking about spawning or she, whichever one you want to go at. But <laughs> they're, they're not just sitting out there just ready to chomp at the first thing that comes by them. So it makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, you know, day three of practice come around, everybody kind of scrapped everything they knew and tried to just put something together real fast. But when we found out that we were going to have the off day or the, you know, the postponed day. I knew it was going to set up better for a tournament standpoint for everybody because it was going to give those fish a whole another 24 hours to get accustomed to what had happened. And it was just going to let it be where if somebody figured them out, they were going to be able to run with it basically, instead of just another changing condition coming on, which it ended up changing during the tournament. But on that first day, it was going to allow those fish to be set up where they're at. And if you figured it out on day one, you know, early enough, you were going to be able to, you know, put some pieces of the puzzle together for that first day. All right. I'm going to throw this question up because it's going to tie into some of the other things that I want to get feedback from you. Michael says, Wes, do you think the home field advantage played for the win? For me, it's a curse here on Bugs Island. Please give me your two cents. Thanks. You know, I really, and I hate to say this, but I really think it did play into me winning. You know, I, I don't know if I would call it an advantage, but once 
once I was able to figure out what the fish were doing or how they were setting up, I automatically knew some places that I had caught them in the past when they were setting up on that exact thing. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was obviously an advantage, but I still had to, it ain't like I just went out there and started running history from the get go. Like I, I still start, I, I checked a few things early in the morning on day one and luckily I landed on them pretty quick and I like a light bulb went off. I was like, okay, I know what they're doing. And, and you know, I just kind of put it together from there, but you know, that that's where it was a big advantage being on a lake that I was so familiar with and had fished so many different times in so many different situations. What was more important for your win instinct or experience? I'm going to go, it's going to have to be experienced just on that particular body of water. I mean, it, because it all look the whole river looks good. All of Neela Henry looks fishy, but there's what's special about that place or, or different is there's, you, you'll have a four mile stretch of river grass on the main channel. And there's two 50 yard stretches that they get in. And knowing that those couple little stretches when, and obviously there were guys that caught them all up and down this four mile stretch let's just say for instance but the majority of the better sized fish always get here and here and i was able to hit those multiple times and then go run two or three multiple times that you know are, are real high percentage areas and i wouldn't have to spend a lot of time just covering water basically all right ryan's got a great question he wants to know what was your biggest adjustment throughout the week that you think helped you secure the win the most? I think, you know, thinking clearly was was a big deal for me all week, not getting locked into one thing because it, it was changing every day. I mean, conditions were changing, weather was changing, the water level changed a lot after the second day. And just, you know, not being afraid to, you know, scrap completely, you know, up my frog bite and go out on the river in the current and fish for spotted bass or, you know, go down some riprap or stuff like that. And then obviously on day four, you know, I scrapped everything I had done and fished a different, uh, a different literally section of the lake, uh, a different technique, uh, swam a jig all day and weighed in every fish on a swim jig that I hadn't done all week. So I think just thinking clearly, making good decisions was, you know, one of the key things for me winning. All right, great stuff. Another question. James wants to know, Wes, can you talk a little bit about the location that you found? Was it close to a deep channel? You know, where where I caught the majority of my fish day one and two was it was actually a bigger creek arm up the river. Um and it really surprised me that there was literally like no pressure in there. I uh I started in there on day one and I think one other competitor started in there and he left after like 10 minutes and then one other boat come in there after about an hour. And on day one, that's the only other person I saw, which, and I'm, this isn't, I mean, Neely Henry's not big. Like this is one of the more popular places on the lake. And, and I mean, there was fish in there cause obviously I was getting some bites and I was just like, I, I can't believe anybody, nobody's in here. And there was a Steve Bowman was actually following me. He was like, dude, did you put up like a gate or something at the mouth of the creek? Cause there ain't nobody in here. <laughs> and I was like, I, I don't know. But I, I started in there the second day and that other competitor started in there with me. And Gerald actually come in there around 10 o'clock as I was leaving out of there. And then I actually started in there on day three again. And Gerald come in there a little bit earlier this time. And I never went back in there on day four because it kind of started getting a little tough in there, it seemed. But um, that was that was kind of weird to me that nobody, really nobody came in there. And I checked this place one day in practice after the water had come up for like 10 minutes. I just kind of trolled through there real fast fishing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a bite. I was in there in the middle of the day, and it was, you know, it was bright bluebird skies. The water had just come up, and it looked good, but everything was under the water a little bit. And there was literally like 10 of our competitors in this creek, and I guess nobody got a bite, and they were just like, well, I mean, I guess a bass don't live in here. But luckily, <laughs> I knew what the creek could produce if the water conditions got back where they were supposed to or if you fished it at a different time. But, you know, be, being in that major creek, I just knew it had a good population of fish, but – I caught fish there that I weighed in, and then obviously uh, the other fish came off the main river channel, which, you know, th those are more, you know, fish that are more apt to be feeding, where the backwater fish were probably more of a, in a spawning mode, I would think. All right, cool stuff. All right, let's talk a little bit about the jig. Uh, my first question is, did you talk to Matt Heron? <laughs> me and Matt Heron talk. <laughs> me and Matt Heron talk a lot. I, and when I say a lot, like you know, two or three phone calls a day. Uh, yeah. Not re not really talking about fishing or practicing anything. Just you know, just kind of you know, touching base and stuff like that. But 
Um, you know, he knows he he's flip, been flipping a jig ten times longer than I've even been alive. Like he was flipping a jig before I was even ever even thought of back in the eighties and nineties, <laughs> and I wasn't born until ninety four. So, but you you know, flipping a, a big jig is a known thing on the Coosa River, and I mean that's just kind of that's how I grew up fishing. Really, I mean that's how I made a lot of money on that lake and. I knew going into the tournament, but when it got announced, I mean, anytime I'm going to Neely Henry or the Coos River in general, I'm going to have a big jig tied on with a Zoom big salty chunk uh, to pitch around. I mean, whether it's in grass, wood, rocks, bluffs, it doesn't matter. I, I'm, I'm going to have it on. And I didn't catch a lot on the flipping jig this week, but I caught two key fish uh, throughout the tournament that, that were really key. And it, I just, it, like I said, that big jig bite is, is real temperamental depending on the water situation the water temperature, what stage the fish are in. So having it, I always have it tied on, but it's not always the key player. All right. Show us the jig. Do you have it in your hands right there? I, I, I actually don't have the Heron jig, but I've got the, the, the day four hundred thousand dollar uh, dirty jigs, no Jack swim jig in my hand. And okay. I, had the, I had the rod with me here at the house that I was doing some stuff with, but it was a, uh, you know, it's a five, six things, no Jack, um, Flip, swim uh, swim jig obviously but uh the the flipping jig we can talk about it for a second it's just a it's a matt heron signature series um it's got a really good hook in it it was a black and blue skirt uh i, I did a little bit of special stuff with the skirt i like to put a few strands of chartreuse in it depending on the water color if it gets a lot little dirty i'll put some of that in there and it's got a, a zoom big salty sapphire blue chunk on it you know it's it, if the water clears up, I like to throw, you know, like a more natural color, a green pumpkin or a brown. But with as muddy and dirty and fast as the water was running, that black and blue is hard to beat. All right, good stuff. Let's see. Uh, can you show us a little bit? Can you? Yeah, yeah. People I'll are wanting it. to see it a little yeah, bit here. It's, it's a, it's the dirty jigs, no jack, and I've got the Zoom Super Speed Crawl uh, Black Sapphire for the chunk or the trailer. And you can see, I don't, you can't really tell on camera because I don't have nothing to compare it to. But that no jack hook is like a gaff. I mean, it's. It's a lot bigger wire than any other swim jig on the market. And for me, and like, like me, and I know Gerald, who was on earlier, me and him, or Canterbury too, when, when they get this thing, dude, we let them have it. Like straight braid, flipping sticks, I mean, jerking as hard as you can. And having a hook like that, you know, is a big deal to not flex it. Because earlier in my, when I was younger, I didn't really get the whole gist of, you know, bigger hooks. I'm jerking too hard. And I flexed a lot of hooks and lost a lot of money because of it. But with this jig, I can promise you that's not going to happen. All right. That is that is good stuff right there. Uh, you know we had Gerald on before mm -hmm. you, uh, and he gave us a big-time buzzbait lesson. Did you mm -hmm. throw a buzzbait at all? Y you know, I, I threw it a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, it's one of them things on the Coos River I've always got one tied on. I just feel like, and I know how good of a buzzbait fisherman Gerald is. I feel like that I'm that good with a with a swim jig. I feel like that if in a swim jig type situation that I, I'm, and not trying to be cocky by no means, but I feel like I'm just I know how to work it. I know the angles to throw it at. I know when to do this with it and when to do that with it. And Gerald's the same way with his buzzbait. So I mean, you got to do what you feel confident in. I knew they were biting a buzz bait. I mean, there's no doubt they were. Obviously, I mean, the dude yeah. almost won the tournament with it. But just from a confidence standpoint, I felt like I could be more efficient and more confident in myself throwing the throwing the swim jig. Um, you know, you're going to miss a few fish on a on a swim jig. You're going to miss some on a buzz bait as well. But just having confidence and knowing me knowing because I mean. I'm, I'm just telling you, dude. When I go on these coastal river lakes or anywhere I can, I'm gonna swim a jig. Like I've seen it. I know different <laughs> conditions when they want it this way, when they want this trailer, when they want it fast, when they want it slow, when they want it hopping. Like I just know when the if the fish can give me a little bit of a clue, I know how to change or how to adjust or make them want to eat it or change a color. So I mean, that was really the main the main thing with me sticking with the swim jig, you know, all day on day four. All right, now. Myself and I, I think a lot of the BTL fans across the country, uh, in a lot of situations where they're throwing a swim jig, they they use white a lot. All right, a white swim jig is used quite a bit. Tell us why black and blue. You know, you the smart thing to say would be, oh well, the water's real dirty, so I threw a dark color. But really and truly, it was. Uh, mainly a pressure, a fishing pressure thing for me because I actually started with a white one uh, early on day four and I caught or actually missed, I don't even know, dude, eight or nine. And then I lost two that I actually hooked. 
And, you know, I finally ended up catching one and I caught a little one. Then I caught another one on it. And it got to be about nine o'clock. And I was like, I kind of I had actually had one fish and I think it was a pretty good one. I didn't get a good look at it, but I come by a clump that, you know, set up perfect with the white one. And it literally ran out there and hit it with its mouth closed, like just kind of bumped it. And I was like, this, wow, this, this ain't the deal. I, I was like, I got to change something because, I mean, I could throw it all day and see eight, 17, 18 pounds and not a one of them get it. So I picked up the black one and I went down a stretch that I that didn't look as good. And I normally don't catch one on. And I actually caught like a pound and three quarter. That was my fifth fish. And I was like, I might be, you know, that one come out there and got it. I mean, and like when it got it, it was like, you know, got it good. And yeah. I went on up a little bit, and then I ended up catching a good one. And then a little bit later, I caught another good one. And then a little bit later, I caught another good one. And it just seemed like it, they just act like they hadn't seen it, like they had seen a thousand white ones come by their face in the past two days. So I, yeah. I think it was more of a pressure deal than a white, than you know, with the white than than a you know a water conditions thing or anything like that. But on the flip side of that, if you're on a lake that Maybe not everybody throwing a white swim jig and, you know, maybe people are more throwing a chatterbait or a spinnerbait or something and you throw the white swim jig, it's going to be a lot more subtle than those baits and they're probably going to commit to it a lot better. But it was just from a, the fish telling me that they're not really committing to it. You know, after the sun, you know, the sun didn't really come out that day for, but it got brighter. Like they, I feel like they could see a lot better and they would just, I don't know, they just came out there and slapped at it where they would really commit to the black one. That's that's great info right there. All right, here's an interesting question from T. He wants to know, Wes, what was going through your mind on day four when the bite wasn't connecting? Oh, I was having a freaking come apart. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it happened fast, too. Like, I started in a little pocket and didn't do any good. And when I come down the river to fish a, a river stretch, I pulled up, and it was like, I got a bite, missed it, got a bite, missed it, got a bite, it blew up and missed it. I hooked one, it come off. I had one blow up and miss it. Then I broke off, like, because I didn't re I hadn't retied my swim jig in like three days, like an idiot, because I hadn't really thrown it. And, uh, but I don't know that it, it, it kind of started to spin me out, but I knew if I was getting that many bites, I just had to make a key little adjustment. And then, you know, I caught one, one actually, I mean, I was fishing like I was the other ones, and one finally got it. And then the next one got it. And then the next one got it. And then they started missing it again. So it was, it was kind of crazy, but, you know, I, I was, I was trying not to spin out, but, but the bad part in my head was I was like, I just had the bites in 30 minutes to put the tournament away and it would have been over with. But I mean, the, it didn't happen that way. And luckily, you know, it worked out for the good. And I was able to keep my wits about myself and, you know, make a few key adjustments and it worked out good. Yeah, that's good stuff. It was very entertaining to watch. Uh, once again, that's another cool thing about the live coverage is you get to see what you guys are going through. <laughs> And uh, extremely entertaining event. Uh, it was a grind when you think about it. Fifty-seven it pounds over four days, uh, but it was it was fantastic from an entertainment standpoint. And and I I really really appreciate the job that you guys did on that final day. And I learned a lot. Wes, I asked this question uh, quite a few times over the years to people that that win. And so many times when you win. It's what you take away and what you learned during that that entire span of the four days of the event. What can you tell us and the fans that you learned from winning? You know, basically what I, I feel like, and I've had a little bit of time to reflect on it. Like, obviously not during the day. I've been wide open during the day. But I've, I, the two nights I've laid down and really just let it all sink in is – you know, I don't know if people know this, but I, I've had a couple of opportunities in the past going into the final day in some really big tournaments leading and have a chance to win. And it just never happened. Like it it, it kind of just fell apart. I was leading the Forestwood Cup on Lake Wachita my rookie year on FLW. I was leading Gunnersville last year on an elite series. And I just felt like going out, looking back on it, I went out and both those day fours wanting it to happen so fast and it just be over with and me know that I won. And I felt like I almost got into that mood, um, you know, on the final day here at Neely when I was missing all those fish. I was like, man, are you kidding me? Like, not today again. Like, don't let this happen again. And then something kicked in my brain. And, and, and I'll give you a little insight on what happened. Or I think, you know, what I think was a big player. Brandon Paulnick actually texted me on day three, the night of day three. He said, look, buddy, we're all pulling for you. We know you have a chance to win again. We know the history. He said, just trust the process and let everything happen. He said, 
it's an eight hour tournament. It can happen in the first 30 minutes or it can happen in the last 10 minutes. That's why it's an eight hour deal. And if it doesn't happen right off the bat, don't spin out. Just keep calm and let it let the process take its place. And I really thought about that during the day. And he he, he was actually at his camper around 11 o'clock uh, and yelled at me across the river. And I, I kid you not, dude, I caught my biggest fish five minutes after he yelled at me. Wow. Now, I, know, I, I know Brandon Paulding is like a fish god and like a fish whisperer. And I don't know if he told that fish to bite my jig or whatever. <laughs> but if that's what happened, that's fine. And if that is the case... Anytime I'm ever in another situation, I'm going to have Brandon Ponick follow me around and yell at me all day. But, you know, that's that's really the biggest thing I think I can take away from this win is trusting my gut and not freaking out and panicking and spinning out when it doesn't happen in the first 30 minutes of the final day if I'm ever in that situation again. Yeah. Dude, I'm telling you, there's a lot of West Logan fans out there. There really is. And uh, I, 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 I it blows my mind that people are fans of a, a dang country boy from Springville, Alabama that just wants, <laughs> I mean, I just go fishing, dude. It, it's nothing. I mean, that's just what I love to do. That's what I want to do. And I, I want to teach people, you know, the way I fish. Cause it's, it's not like, I, I mean, obviously a lot of people fish around here, but the, where I grew up and how I grew up fishing is a, a special place and not a lot of people get to experience that. Yeah. All right. Here's another question, uh, from John. Hey, Wes, does your swim jig swim itself, or do you swim it? You know, I, I've got. I have to have little talks with my jig before the day starts, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, look, buddy, it's time to get your lunch pail and your hard hat on. We're going to work today. I need you. To, I need you to shine for me. You know, I give them that little pep talk, and you know, they'll they'll, they'll do their thing out there. You know, I got to kind of give them a little bit of encouragement. You know, give them that Alabama shake here and there, but. Uh, that's kind of the whole gist of my little swim jig deal. They know what the, the day brings when I bring them out of the rod box. Very cool. All right. Your first win, uh, I got to ask, what was one of the coolest texts or phone calls that you got from somebody? Oh, I need to think about this for a minute. Um, actually, I got one today that kind of uh, – it, it, it kind of got me emotional a little bit. Uh, Trip Weldon actually texted me, and um, – you know, I, I got to, I got to, you know, be with Trip as Trip as my tournament director last year, my rookie year, um, almost all the way through the season. And then, I, if nobody, if not everybody knows, he uh, he got diagnosed with cancer near the end of our um, season last year. And, and he, but he's actually doing really good. I, I think he just, I talked to Hank after the tournament at Needley, and I think he had some tests done, and there's no cancer in his body at this moment. Um, so that's a really a blessing, but. For him to take time out of his day and text me and tell me that it was fun to watch and congratulations, it just just growing up watching you know all the weigh ins and trip being the weigh master and all that stuff. Just for him to take, like I said, for him to take the time out of his day to just text me because I won a, a Bassmaster tournament. I mean, it just it, it really brought me back to you know it, it's a big deal and, and all these people that and, and all the texts I got were important and people that I've looked to, up to for my whole life have been texting me and sending me messages and telling me how uh, you know how awesome of a win it was how my passion you know is what we need in the sport and stuff and you know it just that's the kind of person I am but you know when I got that tri uh, text from Trip it kind of it kind of set me back for a minute and I was like man it's it, it's really real and you know people really watched all this stuff and watched how it went down yeah that is uh really really cool and uh uh i i'd heard that trip was doing a lot better and and hanging in there and things were going well yeah. and what a better person to get a message from I, i'm telling uh, you i mean thank, on your big and, win yeah and thank the lord i mean you know i've been we've been praying for him a lot and and if y'all could if, i mean whoever's watching wants to send up some prayers for him i know i mean i'm not sure he's out of the woods yet but i know he's doing really well and uh, his prayers for him continued would be much appreciated yeah good stuff all right drew from texas along with a lot of other people they want to know what is your setup for the swim jig all right it, it's kind of particular to me and, and you know a lot of people have their own opinion on it and, and this is just the way that i found works best for me um obviously the no jack swim jig from dirty jigs i like the five sixteenths um a lot of people like a three eighths i like the five sixteenths and i like to change my trailers up depending on how deep I want it to run or how fast I use it because I feel like when I get a three eighths in my hand I have to fish it a lot faster than I really want to no matter the trailer I want to use I mean sometimes I want that thing moving a lot and not actually coming to me um 
So I like the five sixteenths and just swap up trailers a little bit. Uh, a lot of times I'm using the Zoom Super Speed Crawl, uh, the Ultra Vibe Speed Crawl, and that, that's really about the only two I'll use. I'll use a couple other, you know, odd and end ones, but mainly those are my main two. Um, the line I always throw sixty pound uh, Sunline FX2 braid. I mean, I, I just I like the sixty pound. I don't like fifty. I don't like forty. I feel like I, I feel like I give it so much shock sometimes when I set the hook that I, I'm liable to break it sometimes. So I like the 60. Uh, the rod I use is the probably the most important part of the whole setup. It's a 7.6, but it's a medium heavy uh, arc reinforcer rod. And the reinforcer is our, our lighter weight blank. It's our more high end blank. So it doesn't really wear on you all day, uh, you know, getting it, holding it up and working it, get, doing the jig, what it needs to do. And I like the length of it, so I don't really have to fish, like sitting with my arms way up. If you watch me on live, I kind of keep my, you know, my elbows tucked to my side and keep my hands kind of down so it doesn't really wear on my shoulders and my back near as bad. It still works on you as the day goes on if you're having to do it all day, but keeping you from having to hold it way up and working through that grass is a big deal with the length of the rod. And then the reel is a Lose Pro TI, a uh, 7, 5 to 1 gear ratio. I think you could probably go up to an eight, maybe. I don't like a real fast gear ratio. I know me and Gerald have the same opinion on this type of stuff. Like, it's kind of like a bicycle. The higher your gears are, the more hard it is to, you know, put some horsepower behind it or some, you know, it, it, you don't, you lose your pulling power. And I mean, some of them bigger fish you hit in that thick stuff, I mean, he goes the other way when he gets it. And you've got to be able to put some torque on him. And then when you get that real high gear ratio, gear speed ratio real you lose everything like you're just sitting there handcuffed just holding so i mean you know a seven's a real good you know medium of the road me you know in the middle of the road uh gear ratio real you've got plenty of speed to work the jig but then you've got some power once you get the fish hooked and can get him out of some stuff so that whole setup i, I mean it just worked for me uh, a lot of people are kind of iffy on the rod length a lot of people like a seven three but I, i'm i'm more of a seven six guy all right, cool. AJ wants to know, kind of a long question. It says, Wes, you spoke about spinning out a moment ago. Other than going off on what other people said, what are some things that you focus on to get back into the groove? Yeah, I wish I was a lot better at doing this uh, than it's going to sound like I am. But, you, you know, you can kind of feel yourself if you tournament fish a lot in any, you know, you can be a club tournament, an evening tournament, anything. When stuff's not really going your way, you know, it's not working. And, and you kind of get a little bit frustrated, you know, you get hung up, get bothered. Something bothers you on the bank or something. The main thing that I've tried to do and, and kind of have figured out is to just focus on getting the next bite in the boat. And once you get one, you can start with the next one and then get the next one. And like, and seriously, before I realized it on day four, I had a limit and I didn't even, like, it hadn't even processed in my mind. I'm like, okay, I'm... I'm real close to where I need to be where an hour ago, heck, I, did, I had one, I didn't even have a bass and I had lost eight of them. So, I mean, just kind of, you know, just settling back down, trying to focus on making the right cast, putting it where it needs to be, you know, getting the next bite and then getting the next one and then, then the next one. Then stuff will start rolling and then you'll ever, for, you'll forget about ever spinning out. Like that, that's what it seems like is going to be the way for me to get better at not spinning out and you know having a bomb of a tournament really yeah all right i was going to bring this up but steven made the comment also ask him about the g-man hug on stage after the win how cool was that oh it was awesome i mean it, it's a moment you can't forget i mean that was there's pictures of it everywhere and just for him to you know you know i i look at him as a friend i, I and i look at a bunch of guys on tour as a friend you don't i mean yeah we go out there and fish against each other but it's you're not fishing and I've said this to a lot of people. I don't go out there on day one of the tournament and be like, I'm going out there to beat Gerald Swindle, Scott Canterbury, Justin Atkins, you know, Clark Wendell. I'm going to beat those guys. I'm not doing I'm going to fish against the fish. They've got to catch their five, and I've got to catch my five. And whoever catches the biggest obviously wins. So, I mean, I look at a lot of guys as my friend. Like, they're competitors. We're all competitors. We want to win every time. We want to beat everybody, but I'm not going to fish against those guys. I'm fishing against the fish. So just for him to come out there when he's been doing this for so long and he's come close to winning so many times and he was really close. I mean, I, he really had a shot to win on that last day. I mean, he got a good start. I didn't know what he had, but I knew he was catching them because I fished a couple stretches that were kind of close. And every time I looked over there, he was in his freaking live well and I still ain't caught one. 
And I'm like, dude, I know, I know what's going on. And he was literally one bite away from, you know, I don't know how many years he's been on the elite series, but he's, he, you know, he's never been able to close the deal. And for him to have been that close, and then me to actually be able to come away with the win and him still come out there and congratulate me like he did. You know, it says a lot about him. Uh, I, I just I can't thank him. enough. All I can remember is I turned around like to go get my trophy and my, my eyes were full of tears and my glasses were falling <laughs> up. And I could barely see him. And I just kind of like, you know, we kind of embraced each other and stuff. And I mean, it, it was a cool little deal. And the real, you know, I don't know if you can call it destiny, fate, iron, ironic or however. Lulu or Leanne was actually standing right beside my, you know, my girlfriend when it all happened. And she actually turned and, and Lulu hugged her about the same time Gerald got a hold of me. So it, it was like an all big family circle right there. But, you know, and the, the Gerald thing, that was that was awesome. But and the, the crazy thing about it was as soon as Gerald let me go, I turned around and Paul Nick standing there to grab me. Scott Canterbury standing there to grab me. Christy comes out on stage and grabs me. And it just... Looking back on it, I didn't really think about it at the time, but these are guys that are like humongous icons in the sport of bass fishing, and they stayed around to watch me, you know, a dang 26-year-old from Springville, Alabama, win a blue trophy. That It, it just it kind of brings me back to reality. Like, you know, I, I just hope that these guys realize how much it means to me and that, that you know, that I'm, I'm really passionate about this. And it's, I mean, this is that's where I want to be, and I appreciate them, you know, all of their support. That's awesome. All right. I want you to tell the fans how much work it is being a champion starting oh, on Monday wow. up to right now. How much work have you been involved with? <laughs> I, I, my phone has been blowing up. Like when, when I say my phone's blowing up, like it's literally going off. Like I don't know if you can see it right now, but it's just full of stuff right now. Like it's, <laughs> it, it, it just continues. It's, it hasn't stopped since Monday. And I didn't have my phone, but my phone was in my boat when I weighed in. And I got my phone back, and it was automatic, like radio stations, podcasts. I mean, yeah. everything was wanting to get on a schedule just right off the bat. And, I, and I mean, thankfully, I've got a great support system. My girlfriend is amazing. I, I can't thank her enough. She got all my stuff scheduled, got it all wrote down for me. And not only that, she's in the middle of nursing school in her third semester. So it's not like she's just sitting around not doing anything. And for wow. her to for her to be able to take care of all that, you know, she's truly a blessing, and and I I don't deserve her. I love her to death. I hope she loves me as much as I love her because I don't know if I'd be able to do it without her. <laughs> That's awesome, man. All right, last question, and then we'll let you go. What can you tell us on what we can expect next week at Lake Gunnersville? What are your thoughts? Oh, me, you know, I'm not a I'm not a huge. I don't live that far from Gunnersville, but I'm not a big local. I, I didn't go up there to fish a lot uh, when I was younger. Obviously, I went to the Coosa River. It's a little bit close to the house. Uh, I, I know Gerald's going to know what's going down a lot more than I am. I I, I would have to say, even though we're ha we're having a little bit of a late spring, um, I know those fish on Gunners will get out, you know, on the shell bars and the ledges and the you know the high spots earlier than a lot of Tennessee River lakes. And I mean, that's what the whole Tennessee River is known for is offshore fishing. So I'm going to have to say that the winter probably, you know, I, I would say the majority of the top 10 is going to be fishing offshore. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a, like every bass in the lake is going to be out deep. Um, I think you're still going to be able to catch some fish shallow. I hope so. I mean, that's what I'm going to try and exploit. Um, I did notice one thing. I walked by the calendar uh, earlier today and the full moon is actually Wednesday night. Um, so, I mean, basically what that tells me, and I'm a shallow water guy, I, I pay attention to that moon phase a lot. And what that full moon's going to be is you're going to have some late spawners as far as bass, and you're also going to have a bluegill spawn. I mean, they're, they're going to be hitting the bank pretty hard. The crappie are going to be spawning. There's going to be a crawfish spawn. The, I, I, learning, be, being a shallow water fisherman growing up, there's always fish to be caught on a full moon shallow. I don't care if it's in July with it 110 <laughs> degrees. Anytime there's a full moon, there's not, there may not be a huge population, but there's going to be somewhere that you can make it happen. And, and I'm not saying you can go win on it or anything like that, but you can, you know, catch a few fish and have a chance to do pretty decent in the tournament. So I think it's going to be a lot of offshore and a couple guys grinding out uh, up shallow, throwing a chatterbait, throwing some top water, fishing boat docks that, uh, you know, kind of, you know, get in that top 20 and stuff like that. All right. I think you're 13th in AOI points. Is that right? I have you know? no, I, I hadn't even looked. I, I just, <laughs> I want to look, I want to look when the season's over. I know, 
I don't have any chance of, of catching fighter. I don't know if anybody has a chance of catching fighter. Dude, he is having an unbelievable year. Shout out to him. I mean, the fact that he's been so close to winning an AOI a couple years with him, you know, the past few years, and he's always stumbled early in the year, you know, like in South Florida and stuff like that. And for him to like, I mean, he has smashed it on all these Southern lakes and everybody knows how good he is up North when we go up there. I think he's almost won Champlain like the last three times we've been there. So, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he wins when we go up there this time. He, he, he I'm going to say he's got it wrapped up. I'm not trying to jinx him by no means, but after last year with me, you know, I missed the classic by two places at like four points. Uh, just, just doing as good as I can these next three tournaments to just solidify me in that 2022 classic. Uh, that's where I want to look when I get there. Like at the end of the la the last tournament at St. Lawrence River, I want you to be like, "Hey, Wes, you're still in 13th in the points." Did you know that? I'm like, "Dang right, I knew that." <laughs> For nice, sure. nice. What's your smallmouth game like, man? Uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna say I'm too bad at it. Um, I actually at, at St. Lawrence last year was the first time I've ever been there, and I really liked the place. It was weird because even though it was real deep. You know, smallmouth fishing, you know, it's got a lot of current, and I grew up fishing current, and it kind of, I mean, current's current. I don't care where you're at. Yeah. I mean, it's just the the fishing in 40 foot was a little bit different, but I really liked it. I didn't have a great tournament. I think I finished in the 50s, but I had a, you know, I had some execution problems. Um, That was the first tournament I'd ever smallmouth fished for with, without using a net. You know, I went to Lake St. Clair with FLW, and we got to use a net, and I mean, yeah. you hooked one. He was called. I mean, it was pretty much easy. But when you get him up beside the boat, I mean, you got a six pounder and some current, and you got to, you know, you got to land him with your your hands and your arms. It gets kind of, <laughs> gets kind of sketchy, especially when you, you know, in practice, I practiced, you know, landing some, and it was fine. Obviously, you can walk around the boat and practice. You ain't worried about it. But you know, on game day, stuff kind of gets in crunch time. And you know, I rushed a couple big fish and lost some at uh, St. Lawrence. But you know, I didn't have a bad tournament. And then we went to Champlain last year also again and you know i think i was sitting in like 12th after day one and then i just had a you know i had one of them bad days on day two and only weighed in i think 12 pounds but i still ended up in the 50s and i actually think if i can have a you know a decent tournament at gunnersville and then even if i finish in the 50s at the last two northern tournaments i, I mean i'm pretty sure i'm going to make the classic so that's a good thing going up there but i mean i i want to be able to you know cut some checks and you know have some good finishes up there as well all right, man. Uh, can't thank you enough for taking time out. Uh, I know you're very busy. I know what it's like after a win, especially your first win. But I'm telling you, Wes, you picked up a lot of Wes Logan fans tonight. And, well, and I can't thank you enough, man. That's good, I hope so. Mr. Mark, I appreciate y'all having me on. And anytime you need some another guest, I'll be happy to come on and talk about anything that I know yeah. a little bit about anyway. Maybe I can teach somebody something. Hey, I'm telling you right now, I'm a Wes Logan fan. <laughs> All right. Best of luck to you next week at Gville. Uh, look for a little bit more uh, live time with you, hopefully. Yes, next sir. Week. For sure. For sure. Sounds good, Mr. Mark. Like I said, I appreciate it being on it. It's really a blessing. All right, man. Take care. Great job. Uh, best of luck next week, man. See you guys. Thanks, sir. All right. There you have it. Wes Logan. Folks, what a great, great winner right there. The dude's got his game together. And uh, the win that was on Bassmaster Live with all the footage on that final day, uh, it was very entertaining. Very entertaining. All right, that's going to wrap this evening version of BTL. Folks, I can't tell you the last time we did an evening show. Uh, we may do this a little more often, but once again, this was a very special show with Gerald and with Wes, uh, with the event taking place next week on Gunnersville. And I uh, can't thank Gerald Swindle enough for taking time out along with Wes. And hopefully, fans, you greatly appreciate some of the juice that both of these guys gave up with what went down at Neely Henry. But, man, I, I am thoroughly impressed with Wes. And uh, who's not a Gerald Swindle fan? So, uh, once again, a big thanks to the fans. Great questions tonight. Just uh, an absolute fantastic show. And I want to remind everybody once again, tomorrow, Frank Scalish, day four, we're back at a different time, 11 a.m. Central Time. We're going to talk non-boaters. We're going to talk co-anglers. We're going to talk about other stuff with Frank Scalish. And if you haven't watched any of the day fours, you need to check it out uh, because Frank is uh, hes amazing, man. He's a genius. 
Uh, more t-shirts coming up. The other thing I want to mention real quick, I see a lot of comments on the instant feedback. People getting their BTL merch. Send me some pictures. I got a couple pictures today via email, marketbasszone.com, of people already sporting their BTL merch. And I have to admit, looking very, very, very fine with the BTL merch. So uh, if you missed out on that one, I mentioned earlier this week, we're going to try and crank out another uh, special run in the coming weeks to where you can pick up some more BTL garb. All right, that's going to wrap things up. Uh, Let me... Flying solo here. I got to cue up the music. There we go. And we're going to be back tomorrow right here on BTL. Don't forget, subscribe to us on YouTube. We've only been doing this a little over a year. We're approaching 10,000 subscribers. We're going to have a party when that happens. If you're around Oklahoma, I might invite everybody too. We'll see about that. I've got some connections. I might be able to pull off a nice little BTL party somewhere in the Oklahoma City, Norman metro area. We'll see. We'll see how quickly we get to 10,000. And then, if you're listening to the podcast on iTunes, make sure you leave us a rating and a review. It helps us out and Matt out immensely. That's it, folks. Good night. We're out of here.